Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this panel, The Asian Art World and COVID-19. We're so grateful that so many of you could join us from so many places across the world today for this very topical and, and very important subject for today's art world. My name is Malcolm McNeil, and I'm the incoming director of the SOAS Postgraduate Diploma in Asian Art, taking over this summer from Dr. Heather Elgood. And I'm also a senior lecturer in arts education at the School of Arts in SOAS here in London. The SOAS Postgraduate Diploma is a unique programme centred on object-based study and underpinned by rigorous scholarship. The programme sits at a nodal point in the overlapping fields of academia, the museum world and the art market. And it's in that spirit of connectivity that, it, that I take great pleasure in welcoming our expert panel today to join me in discussing the Asian art world and COVID-19. Our first speaker is Mr. Calvin Hui. Calvin is a cultural entrepreneur. He is a gallerist, a curator, a collector, and among many other things, a connector of both people and of ideas. He is based in Hong Kong, but active across East Asia and here in the UK. Calvin has numerous strings to his bow, including, but not limited to, his role as co-owner of 3812 Gallery and as founder and director of Ink Now, a cultural brand dedicated to contemporary ink art through a raft of publications, exhibitions, events and award-winning expos. Thank you very much for joining us today, Calvin. Our second speaker is Anna Jackson. Hi. Keeper of the Asia Department at the Victoria and Albert Museum the world's leading museum of art, design and performance. In addition to her long-standing leadership of the V&A's Asia Department, Anna has curated several groundbreaking exhibitions addressing subjects and material from across Asia. Her most recent project is the critically acclaimed exhibition Kimono from Kyoto to Catwalk, sadly currently shuttered as part of the UK lockdown in response to the current pandemic. Our third speaker is Jonathan Stone, Christie's co-chairman of Asian Art and deputy chairman for the Asia Pacific region. Jonathan leads Christie's global specialist teams in Asian Art, covering auctions, private sales, and particularly topical in our current climate, e-commerce. While he also supports the auction house's broader activities and initiatives across the Asia Pacific region. Our final speaker, is Victor Wong. Victor is a pioneer in the truest sense of the word, with a long and illustrious career in computer-generated imagery, not only exploring but creating new spaces through digital design. Victor more recently turned his hand to ink painting around five years ago and has since developed the world's first artificial intelligence capable, capable of producing Chinese traditional ink painting materials which Victor has christened AI Gemini. And Victor has told me he views his process as collaborative, blending man and machine, combining the agency of both human and artificial intelligence to produce starkly original objects and arresting images in brush and ink on paper. As a true digital native, I look forward to hearing Victor's views on the implications of COVID-19 for the Asian art world. And now my opening question addressed to the whole panel. How is COVID-19 impacting you or your organisation and how are you adapting? Calvin. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, Soa. Thank you, um, Malcolm. Uh, it's my pleasure to um, speak in this panel today. Uh, well, I believe uh, the COVID-19 pandemic causes uh, a lot of challenges uh, to everyone. Um, I think we are all now facing it. Um, I'm now in Hong Kong. Uh, I have a gallery in London and Hong Kong, and also I run Art Fair and also a art platform called Inc. Now, uh, which I started in 2019 in Taipei and Shanghai and Hong Kong. Um, 
Originally, uh, we, we plan to bring Inc. Now to London this year, and also we have a, 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 a full um, program uh, of exhibitions and also other activities um, throughout this year. However, I think uh, like other institutions like museums or auction house, uh, we do need to um, respond to this situation and then to uh, adapt and then change our plan. Well, um, during the last few months, um, I think from, from, from different aspects, I do adjust and also work with my team very closely. Uh, I think uh, uh, on one point is about the emotion, em, 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 emotional uh, management, because um, in the UK, I know it's locked down and then in, in China, in Hong Kong, in Taiwan, we, we cannot travel. And I have staff in, in, in China and in Hong Kong and also colleagues in Taiwan and London as well. So um, this time, I think very importantly, um, we were very hard together. Uh, we reconnect um, with values of faith, hope, love, and nature. This is also something that we already always remind ourselves. This is a very difficult time, uh, but then we gather the positive energy and then uh, we work together. We keep ourselves busy and very high morale. So in the last two, three months, actually, um, our, gallery, our gallery has um, launched various uh, new initiatives. For example, uh, online viewing rooms, uh, online panel discussions. Uh, we care about um, the relationship with the artists, particularly uh, during the difficult times. So we communicate with our, our artists re uh, very regularly and we launched Artist Diary to give them a platform to share their views and experience and also to share with our collectors and audience uh, how artists uh, work or live uh, during this this time and we got a very um, positive feedback from our collectors and audience. We also have um, launched various new columns in our website and social media like called um, Art Piece, uh, A-R-T article and also we have a constant newsletter to engage with our collectors. Um, we also published a lot of articles and news in WeChat and also our social media platform. Um, so we hope um, very soon, um, like in China, they already uh, began to resume back to normal. In Hong Kong, we also uh, bit by bit, uh, uh, our situation became improved. And then uh, we are now planning to uh, reopen the gallery uh, in Hong Kong and London on the 15th of June. So. Um, uh, on the slide, you can also see um, how we like to engage our staff, colleagues, uh, co-workers, and also our partners and collectors. Uh, from in this triangle, I try to also um, consider or to um, to develop um, something more meaningful uh, based on the artistic production, and then we have to also reconsider the curatorial ad adaptation and how we engage. Uh, the collectors in this pandemic um, um, moment uh, because we lost the connection of the face-to-face -face physical um, connection and face-to-face -face interactions but then um, we also still need to uh, run our, our operations we still need to launch our projects um, we also try to tell um, the market and tell the collectors and, our, and tell the artists that um, we positively face this um, challenge and then we find different uh, ways uh, to tackle and also to overcome this. That's why uh, we are now uh, launching this new theme called uh, Reconnect because um, we believe that uh, during this time it is so important that we have to rebuild the connection between people and countries and also be between human and nature. So um, so the other thing is uh, talk about curatorial ad adaptation. Um, so uh, we are we are specializing in Asian contemporary arts uh, with a focus on ink um, and we also uh, initiated the notion of Eastern origin in contemporary expression. Um, during this pandemic time, especially um, uh, the period of uncertainty, uh, I believe people tend to look for like spiritual inspiration or spiritual enlightenment. Um, 
For example, when we look back uh, on the 1950s and 1960s after World War II, um, many people, uh, especially in Europe, um, they became very interested in Eastern uh, thoughts, uh, such as Zen Buddhism, because I believe um, they like to also get some kind of like um, uh, comfort or mindfulness or contemplation uh, through art and then to get inspired to review uh, what's going on um, in the current situation and also to move on uh, to a new page of life. Um, so when, when, when I mentioned this spiritual uh, abstraction, I also quite strongly believe that um, after this pandemic, um, the, 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 the culture of, uh, of, 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 of Asia, the Asian culture or the, 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 the uh, components um, in the Asian arts, we talk about the spirituality, will become more and more, um, I don't want to say popular, but maybe more and more uh, people will, uh, will, 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 will be reminded um, this is also another uh, shifting trend that we may also uh, foresee. Um, so uh, in, in, in next, next month, uh, I'm very happy to, to announce uh, our uh, artist Xiaoqing will be um, um, having uh, his major solo exhibition in Mount Rothko Art Centre. Uh, as the celebration of uh, his 85th anniversary. So um, two um, spiritual abstraction master uh, from East and West meet. I think this is also quite a, um, a, a perfect timing that um, we can also um, to study this artist's work, to reveal the spirituality from this artist's work and to reflect and, and, and to see um, what happens now in the world. And then this is also the time for us to rethink um, uh, many different aspects of our life. So uh, I would say um, maybe the pandemic will also accelerate this sh uh, shifting trend uh, to um, call for the, the understanding of the cultural identity, uh, to call for the understanding of our history and also our cultural origin, and also to address the need for balance and harmony in life. Um, I think this is this is also uh, the moment for more and more Chinese or Asian artists to um, uh, to introduce or to 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 give um, more um, exposures of their uh, spiritual pursuit uh, through art and also to rethink the relationship between human and nature through art. So as a founder uh, of the art fair and the platforms like 312 Gallery, Inc. now and previously uh, Inc. Asia, um, I believe the Eastern origin has also helped us to reflect the history and tradition, uh, to question the reality. Um, so perhaps um, the globalization of art in the next stage will also bring um, cultural diversity, especially from the, uh, from, from, from the Asian side. And another um, topic that maybe we can, we, we will not um, avoid is about the virtual economy or the online engagement. Um, as a gallerist or the art fair platform, um, I believe this, uh, this time um, the uh, technology is so vital, so important. Um, I should see the importance of the integration of art and technology, uh, which is not just from the tech technical or, or business side, um, but also how technology reshapes the art world in, for example, artistic production to uh, collector's engagement. Um, in this slide, you can see um, like the right hand side, in the last two, two months in China, uh, during this COVID-19 pandemic, there are over 300 museums in mainland China launched over 370 online exhibitions and 12 museums organize almost 100 live streams, uh, achieving like over millions of, 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 of um, audience. So um, to us, um, online engagement um, is a trend um, and we also need to try and uh, try out and develop um, more unique content uh, to engage the new collectors, particularly the millennial generations. But at the same time, I also see it is also important to engage the general public. Um, the, the, the integration with, uh, of technology will also enhance uh, the art education. 
and also the appreciation appreciation of arts and also the community community engagement. So um, I I found uh, this is a very difficult but also interesting time. And as uh, um, as uh, art market professionals, um, I will definitely continue to work with uh, our colleagues uh, in this panel to explore and discuss further how the Asian art uh, market will uh, will rise. Uh, in the global platform. Thank you. Calvin, thank you. Calvin, thank you so much for such a such an in-depth and rich response to that opening question. Um, I'd like to move on now to, to pose this question to Anna. How have you at the VNA been impacted by and how are you adapting to the current climate of COVID-19? Okay, well thank you Malcolm and thank you very much for um, asking me to uh, participate in this wonderful panel. Well, the Victorian Abbey Museum is a vibrant, dynamic institution. We welcome something like 10,000 visitors a day from the UK and around the world to the Museum in South Kensington, and of course more to the Museum of Childhood and v &A Dundee. And these people engage with our objects in our permanent galleries. They um, see special exhibitions we put on. They participate in events. And they just enjoy the, the, the cafe or the shop or particularly at this time of year, the garden. So, of course, now we've just we had to close our doors. I think our last day was the 18th of, of March just before lockdown. So now the museum is, is, is quiet and dark and only our security staff and state staff are monitoring the galleries for us. And this is really very painful for all of us. I mean, our, our resident debtors, every instinct we have as a public museum is to, is to have our doors open because we're there to share our collections and our spaces with as many people as possible. And for me personally, it's been uh, very painful because as you mentioned, I've, um, we just launched our exhibition, Kimono Kyoto to Catwalk. This is four years of my hard work. And to see it close after 19 days was very, very sad. And this is one of the saddest pictures I have of, of my colleagues in the textile conservation section covering up the objects to protect them from dust while we had our closure. And also we shouldn't really think, we have to think there are mammoth financial implications for the VNA for every museum in the world because of closure. Um, and that's a, a big challenge we'll have um, going forward. But for now, Though our doors might be shut, we remain open. Next slide, please. Um, and like many museums, we've reached out through digital means to our existing audiences and hopefully to new audiences. We're lucky in the VNA that we have a very well established um, website and social media channels. Um, and really, we've just sort of thought of new ways of, sort of engaging with audiences. I think. Obviously, um, the number of people who are sort of accessing material from the VNA online has, has risen dramatically. We now have 3.5 million social media followers. And with our social media posts, one of these you can see on the left, we tend to do quite quick and quirky kind of content, which is really um, inviting audience participation, in, inspiring sort of creativity out there. We also have um, sort of more focused look at aspects of the collection. We send out e-letters to those who've subscribed. We have a dedicated YouTube channel. So what we did for the exhibition, just before those uh, the uh, tissue went around those objects you saw in the previous slide, we quickly made a film. I think we filmed for about three hours in the exhibition, um, just me and two photographers, uh, doing a tour of the exhibition, which we now edited into five short films, and they went live a couple of weeks ago, and we've had 215,000 views, I think, um, by now, and again, very, very positive response to that, which has been great. And I thought I also should mention that we have our own dedicated so Chinese social media channels on WeChat and Weibo, and in the middle here, you see just one of the initiatives we've done that. We do some very dedicated kind of material for our Chinese social media. And in fact, we're the only Western museum to be ranked as one of the top 10 museum profiles on these channels. And this was a particular sort of competition we ran in, in April and May, which was to for people to style themselves up um, as a VNA poster. So these are famous posters from exhibitions, including Chinese paintings there, David Bowie, Hollywood costume, Horst and Frida Kahlo exhibition, Making Yourself Up, um, where people sort of reinvented them uh, rather cleverly. So that's very, very sort of, again, inspiring sort of creativity in our audiences. And I think it will be very interesting to see what happens in the future about how, whether all this use of digital media is really will really change the way we 
we um, engage with our audiences going forward. But of course, for now, uh, we are um, hopefully planning for the reopening of the museum, which we're again not sure of dates exactly, but hopefully in, in the next couple of months, we will be welcoming physically people back through our doors. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, now, Jonathan, to, to turn to you, how is COVID impacting Asian art at Christie's and how are you adapting to the current situation? Great. Well, thanks, Malcolm. Um, and thanks to Sir. It's a, it's a privilege to be on this panel. Um, I think that the first thing that I was thinking about is, is are, are very practical things. One of the big issues we've had is not being able to travel. Um, nobody's been able to travel for what is almost six months now. I think this has been a big issue for us because it's really impacted our ability to source material for the sales. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit later about how we have improved sort of digital connections and remote connections. But still, when you're dealing with great works of art and you want to convince somebody to consign to the sale or they want to see you, um, I think as everybody here knows, it's really difficult not to actually go and see the physical work of art and it's incredibly difficult not, be, not to be able to talk to the consigner or the person, the collector, face to face. So I think that's been a real issue. Um, I think the other thing, of course, has been the degree of uncertainty because like everybody, you know, we have to make plans. All of us are making plans for whether it's exhibitions or sales or whatever, you know, projects that we're all working on. So I think not knowing what is coming down the road. And I remember that, you know, in Hong Kong back in February, we were thinking this is all going to be over by April. But excuse me, here we are in the middle of June and most particularly is not. Um, Hong Kong is much better off than a lot of other places, of course. But it's this uncertainty and the difficulty of being able to plan. You know, as we say, you come up with a plan B, but you need to come up with a plan C, D, F, G and H as well. Because you really, and this, you know, on a very practical level, I think these have been some of the challenges that we've had. Um, the uncertainty, of course, impacts us because people are concerned about the market and they're concerned about where the market is going. Um, but I think what is significant for us in our business is that, as indeed was true during the financial crisis of 2008-9, there is, there is an appetite to buy. Um, but again, for the reason of not being able to meet people, uh, and also because of uncertainty, it's a greater challenge for consigners than it is for buyers. Because for buyers, whatever the circumstances, if you have a great work of art, it could be a once in a lifetime opportunity and they will continue to, be, to buy. Um, and there are opportunities there. Um, having said that, I think there are actually a few silver linings to the cloud to this COVID cloud that we live under. Um, one is that it's actually made us speed up a lot of developments which I think were already happening, but is actually incrementally increased that. Um, Calvin referred, I think, to online sales and so on, where we've really ramped up our online sales I and mean, they were happening anyway, but now this is very much more part of our daily life and we've increased significantly the number of online sales and also what is being offered in the online sales. And the online sales have been doing extremely well. And that's not just party political propaganda. I mean, it's absolutely verifiable truth. Um, they have been doing really, really well. Um, I think it's also made us think more about how we engage people remotely. We have sales coming up in Hong Kong at the beginning of July, and these will be live sales but many people can't travel here. So how do we engage with them? You have traditional tools, but also there are so many more tools that you can use now that didn't exist before. We've developed very quickly a lot of social media ways of interacting with our clients. Um, there's been a lot of activity on WeChat and all the other Chinese media. Um, but it's not just restricted to that. There's a whole range of things that we've been doing that enable us to present ourselves and also importantly enable the buyers to participate in the sales, even if they you know, physically can't be in the room. Um, so I think those are some of the things. But 
I, I'm quite keen to think that there are there is this silver lining because it really has made us think about things that we hadn't quite thought about and it has speeded up a lot of the things that were coming anyway but it's actually made them happen much much more quickly um, so there's some negative and uncertainty but I think on the other hand there is quite a degree of positivity in a way and that's what we're kind of looking at. Thank you very much Jonathan um, well with that sort of digital pivot, that acceleration of um, existing moves towards the online in mind and that digital environment. I'd like to turn to you, Victor, as someone who um, is very much at home in these, these kinds of spaces, to tell us how COVID has impacted your work as an artist and how you have adapted. So I would like to um, uh, introduce a little bit of my work and then how the COVID-19 affects my, my work and uh, nowadays. So I, I come from a background, I use a computer as a tool uh, to create uh, visual work uh, way back in 1989 when I do like movies and games and all that. But now I used um, uh, the AI uh, and computer uh, to create uh, Chinese contemporary ink paintings. So um, like uh, uh, for a few, few years ago, I was um, uh, invited to do a, a, a work which is um, uh, converting an animations, uh, ink painting into animations. So um, after that, I think, well, computer and the ink painting, Chinese traditional ink painting and AI combined together should be very interesting. So I created my own AI, which is now my creative partner uh, to create ink painting. So he, he got a body you can see as a robot arm and I, and I set up um, with a real ink and, and papers and, uh, and water to have him to draw ink paintings by himself. So how, how, how's the process going is that I, I copy the, um, the practice of Chinese ink painting. So when we do Chinese ink painting, uh, where a, a traditional Chinese, we render it around, we do, uh, uh, we do other works and then come back and then we thought about what we have encountered and then start to do the painting. It's, it's kind of mindscape. So I asked a Gemini, my, my creative partners, AI, to create a landscape, which is virtual landscape first based on parameters like uh, gravity, like uh, erosions, like all that. And then after he created the 3D virtual landscape, he will find an angle because I film movies a lot. I teach Geminis to find a good angle to, to live draw uh, the, uh, the landscape. So he start doing live drawing of the virtual landscape using real paper and ink. So he's come up with some details and the interactions of the paper and then water. So that is something that um, a, a, an AI can create uh, mimicking the process of, it, of, a, um, of a Chinese art uh, scholars, painter, artist to create a meaning. But the problem is that um, the, it affects, uh, I mean, the COVID-19 19 affects us because um, there's so many details in the painting because the interaction between the paper and the ink, I have to show to the collector that um, how does that look? How, how is this under natural light? How, how, how do we create a reality um, through internet and videos and, and photos? So I created this setup that I can picture and the video uh, and, then, and, then, and then film the very little details of the artwork uh, and, and show it to the, to the audience, um, to, the, to my collectors that how fine painting it is. So that is something that has changed. But, after, uh, but there's will be cons and, and prawns uh, uh, because of the COVID-19 because I, it forced me to set, put this set up and then uh, now I can archive my work and uh, like uh, hundreds of pictures using this archive. And also, also I, I, I thought about like this, there's no physical uh, galleries uh, opening that, and all that. I create my own museum, uh, virtual museum to showcase my paintings like this and I put in virtual reality, I even can create uh, like an uh, like, uh, uh, ancient uh, 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 Greeks-like uh, environments that put my paintings on. And then uh, people can use the VR uh, and then go in. And, and, and also I can go forward further because not necessarily we see the paintings in the gallery. We can go to the moon, like my, my series said, Fast Half the Moon. Why, why not we create a, 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 a exhibitions on the moon. So I can create a virtual moon based on the uh, real data and then I create my exhibition on the moon. And how about underwater? 
um, have anyone that have an exhibitions underwater with like paintings, but I can create an underwater environment to put my paintings on and have it. So this is kind of, um, uh, we have some problems and we overcome it and come up with, with some uh, extra, I will say it, it inspire us to do more and then uh, it, will, it will have a new path to go into the future. I think, um, uh, of course, yes, COVID-19 affect all of us, but it also give a chances to create another path to keep us survive. So this is uh, what I think we should think uh, and react to it more positively. So that's my, <laughs> that's my, my reaction to that. Victor, thank you very much. And thank you all for your, your very in-depth and diverse answers to that opening question. Um, I think it's very interesting that, as Jonathan rightly points out, we are all so constricted in where we can go. And yet Victor, as a digital artist, is taking us to the bottom of the sea and to the surface of the moon. Um, that's very, very refreshing and very uplifting. Um, so a, a quick follow up question to all of you, if you could answer with maybe one example um, uh, in, in response to this, this follow up question. It seems that we're all taking a digital pivot in, in how we engage with our audiences, that whether in museums, art fairs, auction houses, or as practicing artists. But how much of what you are doing in each of your respective roles is an amplification of what you were doing before? And can you give us one example of something completely new that has been undertaken um, in the face of COVID-19? Um, perhaps we can start uh, with um, Anna here on this one. I think what I'm doing on a day to day basis is an extension of what I do as a, as a curator anyway. It's a bit odd as I sit in my home to think that there is a public and audience out there, but I know they're there and everything I'm doing now is either for that audience now or for that audience in the future. I think apart from me grappling with the um, technology, I think for the museum, it's been interesting to think about whether we would collect anything that is to do with COVID-19. And my colleague, uh, Brendan Cormier, who, who's not in my department particularly, so it's not an Asian initiative exactly, but um, the idea about what people have asked, you know, do you collect something that's to do with the, the crisis, a crisis that is so fast moving and then we don't really know what's going to have meaning for the future. But we have started to collect um, handmade signs so the rainbow symbols, you've got a rainbow behind you there, but the rainbow symbols everyone's put up in their windows, the signs that have gone out either just to tell you that the shop has closed or to raise awareness of a good cause or to, to sort of um, just show support for something. So we've been um, sort of engaged with sort of collecting those, which is you know, we've got an amazing response to that. Um, so that's the one thing I think the museum has thought, how could we you know, do something that we would normally do curatorially, but in a slightly different way? So it's something that's been an existing practice that's been adapted and applied yeah. to the COVID situation. Yeah. Um, Jonathan, could you give us perhaps an example of, of something completely new that Christie's has done in response to COVID-19? Or is it all, as you said, the acceleration of existing initiatives that were ongo ongoing anyway? Mm, I, think, I think it's honestly the acceleration of many initiatives that were ongoing. Um, I, you know, I think it's the same with everybody else what is the future going to look like? Um, I think this, you know, this is a, this is a big question. Is the future going to be that we will have 50% of our sales online, for example? Um, I mean, that would be something new. Yeah. Um, but I, to be honest with you, Mark, I struggle at the moment to sort of predict the future like that. I yeah. sure don't have a crystal ball. Sure. Um, but I think, I really do think it's very much about the acceleration. Um, and I think, you know, there are there are new initiatives, not that they might not have come anyway, but I think that because of COVID-19, they really have been accelerated and come down the road much quicker. And I think, as I was saying, it's really forced us to take to take new actions to think about how we engage with people in different ways. Mm. And, you know, the question again is, are you, you know, are we going to have been in a world in which a large number of people will convene in one place in the future? Thank you. Um, Calvin, perhaps you could respond from the, the, the art fair side of the art market here. So, so the, the new thing to me, uh, especially in the last two years, I have been on the road uh, constantly. So these two, two, three months, uh, like everyone, uh, slow down, uh, give a lot of time to think and also to um, develop some new initiatives. 
that um, is already in the plan, but uh, previously have no time to, to, to really go down into details, no time to really move things forward. So I think this is um, also, this is a good, good thing for me to really to work with um, my team to prepare for some new initiatives, which we hope to launch um, in 2021. Um, and also, um, we have also uh, launched like online viewing room and, and, and uh, revamped the website and also uh, push ourselves, like Jonathan said, um, to really engage ourselves um, in the digital side. So, um, yeah, uh, something that's still uh, being crafted, being built. So um, maybe you can share with you later. <laughs> Great. More things in the pipeline. So, Victor, you, you told us about AI Gemini. You told us about your, your creation of a robotic arm with an artificial intelligence that can produce original ink paintings. Has COVID-19 inspired you to, to create something equally innovative and new? Or are you looking again at, um, at COVID as a, an agent for accelerating processes you were already taking on? Well, I think as a human, as a human, uh, when, we, when we have pressure, we react to that. And through these reactions, we'll come up with a new path. And to, to, it's, it's a kind of survival game. Uh, now, uh, say, um, the uh, collectors cannot see the actual work. So how I responded to it, to have a like, high resolution representation of my work. And then um, maybe in the future, they would like to have a, like virtual exhibitions. How do they entire, uh, go into these virtual exhibitions? Is it um, the only way through the internet? Is there any other ways to do it? I, I'm looking forward for this new technologies coming in. Uh, as I like a computer uh, artist, I use computer all the time. And it's ready to go online or offline. But it is, it's turned out that when we, when we face the realities, how we represent the realities in the virtual world, that is the question. So I would like to see more technologies come out, how to recreate the realities inside the virtual world that we can go into and then with the physical interaction of that. And I will see once that coming out and there will be no return world. I mean, everyone say, okay, I will go to Dubai and then I go to Paris and I go to Hong Kong, just a click. And this is somehow, it's happening. It's happening in the future. Oh no, it's happening now. And then we go into the future. I will see that. Okay, great. That's, I mean, Jonathan has no crystal ball, but um, it seems like you do. And it's, it's great to, uh, to get those insights from you as someone who's so actively involved in engineering those environments that you predict we'll all be inhabiting in the next few years. Um, it seems like the conversation has gravitated in a number of cases towards collecting towards this um, this relationship to objects in the physical world and the need to see them in person. And I think that's a nice thing to come back to after Victor's um, prompts that we're all going to be inhabiting a, a VR environment in the next few years. So perhaps um, I'd like to address this first to, to Jonathan and Calvin, because your relationship to collectors and collecting is, is subtly but importantly different from Anna's and Victor's. That your, your modus operandi, if you will, the kind of engagement with art you're trying to engender is at a very basic level a transaction. It's, a, it's an acquisition of something and a collection of something. Um, and in Christie's, as well as in Inc. Now and 3812, that's very much achieved by this um, charismatic, almost sort of erratic experience of, of sharing a space with an object and feeling a sense of real intimacy with it. So how do you create that intimacy? And how do you, it, within the confines of COVID-19, and how do you do it safely with the current health constraints on uh, on risks of infection and infection control? I think that clearly there, there are a number of ways in which you can visualize an object or you can present an object. I mean, there's a huge amount you can do with sort of um, very high tech photography. You can take 3D images. There's an awful lot you can do to present an object as it is. I mean, there's a lot you can do for art in terms of you, you create a condition report, you can, there's a, there's a lot you can present. And in a way, to be frank, that buying remotely is nothing totally new because we, we know that at auctions in the past, people have been buying without seeing the work necessarily at first hand. You know, they've been bidding on a telephone or they've been bidding online 
in an auction where we have the agents to bid. So in a sense, it's nothing new, but as I keep, seem to keep saying, it is an acceleration of this trend. Um, and I think that the way you present the objects um, will be increasingly high tech. Um, in terms of in terms of the sort of health issues, um, clearly there are restrictions. I mean, when we have our auctions in a month's time, I think there will be restrictions about how many people can fit into a room. Perhaps, um, you know, we have very clear guidelines on, you know, temperature checks, we have health declarations, registration, all that kind of thing. Um, so. I wouldn't say that those are at all going to be barriers, but I mean those are things that we need to we need to deal with. But there still will be an opportunity of people being able to come in and see an object at first hand, which to me still remains important. It just, in a way, it's the management of that process and the management of the time, um, and that uh, that's I think where we have to be very smart, so people do feel safe and secure walking into a gallery space. Um, you can ask people to wear masks and everything, you know, there is a lot that can actually be done, I think, to make people feel much more secure. Um, so I, I think that by a combination of technology and also careful hygiene management, for want of a better word, you, this is something that, that, that I think we, we, we can do, we can achieve. Um, so I, I, again, you know, I'm confident that people will continue to acquire and collect. I, I don't think this is something that's going to be stopped by COVID-19 for a second. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, Calvin, um, in your art fairs and art expos in your gallery, how are you able to create that, that sumptuous environment, but at the same time ensure safety and, and security from infection? Well, this is the time for us to demonstrate um, how we uh, provide our services professionally, how we interact with um, collectors and audience um, with a, a responsible and also honest manner. Um, uh, recently, actually, uh, we have an American collector client. Um, definitely, uh, we need to uh, work with him because um, he, and, he and his consultants uh, needs to acquire some art from us. And then uh, we work with like Victor, actually it's a tech inc. Uh, to have um, a lot of like uh, video con uh, video um, videos and also high resolution photos to share with the uh, with the clients and this is also uh, to show um, how uh, how we can be reliable and how we can be also um, uh, we give confidence to our our collectors and another thing is I I believe uh, it's not every time it's not just about uh, sales transaction. Sometimes it's about how you maintain the relationship, how you um, uh, uh, communicate with collectors to respect them, also to care about. Um, uh, I, I, I always say now the first priority is uh, personal and public safety and to our staff, to our colleagues and our, our workers. And, and in the gallery, uh, we also um, have like all the measures of like um, uh, uh, hygiene and safety, uh, face masks. We prepare uh, all these uh, um, um, necessities um, to have the clients to come over to have private viewings. So um, in the last two months, uh, I, I, I cannot complain because uh, we still have clients to, to visit our gallery. So we do all these measures. Uh, we respect them, we give them space, and we do the transactions as well. Uh, in, the, in the art fair side, um, this is also the moment for us to remind ourselves how important to continue to engage um, the market and the collectors, not just about um, the selling art pieces, but it's also about like education, sharing of knowledge. So um, so this is the time for, it's, it, it's a test um, for all of us, I think we should also be more open-minded to see and how we can also um, embrace this time to do something differently. Okay. Calvin, thank you very much. Anna, can I turn to you now from a collecting point of view, but as an institutional collection? Um, the V&A as a museum of art and design and performance, 
has a very different remit than and a very different relationship to the world than the collectors who work with with Jonathan and Calvin. What in the V&A's collection and in the V&A's Asian collection specifically do you think could provide inspiration to design that responds to COVID-19? Oh, sorry, I thought you were going to ask me about physicality of objects there, which, of course, is probably the most important thing for a museum curator and for our audiences. It's the, it's yeah. the physical engagement with the objects. And I think for all this wonderful digital technology, which allows us to reach far more people than would actually come to the museum, there is still something to be said for the physical engagement mm -hmm. with, the, with, with objects. And it's whether you can use any of these tools to, you know, you were talking, you'd be talking about sort of wonderful um, photography that you can use now, you know, to sort of really hone in on objects to give you stuff, you know, for me, I'm a textile person. So being able to show all the layers of textile, the embroidery, the different techniques that are used, and whether you could use any of that to, to bring objects alive in a, in a different kind of way to inspire a certain creativity. I think for us working in the Asian world, I mean, a lot of it is about the connections that we have with people in Asia as well. As you were saying, John, so you can't travel anywhere. So you've got to sort of maintain those kind of relationships and those kind of joint projects and those joint initiatives that we can still have for the, for the future. But I think the remit of the VNA is to inspire creativity and certainly through sharing our Asian collections, perhaps with audiences that aren't familiar with Asia, you know, that's a very, very important remit. And I think what we learn through these periods where we aren't, our doors aren't open, I think is a way of thinking about how we might engage in the future. And, and as, as John was saying, you know, build on the things that we might have been thinking about already to, to really sort of um, engage in a slightly different way. But I would never want to lose the physicality, the physical engagement with the objects that you have from, that's why people come to museums and that difference from seeing something online. If you buy something from one of Jonathan's sales, you still want, you still get that lovely object, hopefully arriving at your door at some point. And, and I think for us, that's important. And also the museums themselves are, are you know, are social spaces. I mean, it's about sort of, you know, the, I'm sure if, you know, as, as to begin with, I'm sure there'll be far fewer people will be able to come to the museum and there'll be a joy for some people to be able to wander around their own, their favourite galleries totally on their own. I mean, that will be a pleasure for lots of people. But for others, you know, museums are a social space. They're about the sort of dialogue that happens between people and between objects. And, and we think of the museum as being a sort of crowded, exciting space. And it's going to be a very, very different space for quite a long time. And we'll have to somehow adapt to that. OK, OK. Um, so what, what measures will you at the V&A be taking to allow these makers and designers who draw in your collections to access them? When, when, when the designer is banging on your door, expect to be left back in again to access the reserve collection? Oh, well, we, um, we're not sure entirely when we're going to be able to reopen the museum. Um, you know, we're in the sort of last phase of reopening. For gov obviously, we'll follow government guidelines as a government museum. We hope that we will be able to um open the door sometime in in july and august and obviously we are thinking we're modeling a number of scenarios now and it will be about you know how many people will be able we certainly can't welcome about ten thousand people a day through our doors you know how many people will be able to come to the museum at any one time whether we'll have to have particular routes through the galleries you know the hygiene environment we'll have to maintain and so on um and certainly we will but we will still allow people back to see our, you know, make appointments to see objects that perhaps non, aren't on display, like in the print room or the Asian study room. Um, it just, we might have to limit groups. Mm -hmm. And in terms of teaching, the teaching we do for SOAS, I mean, one of the great pleasures of, of, of teaching on that course is that the students are able to come uh, to see objects and, and to handle them. And, and you know, that, that, that probably won't be happening for a while because we won't be able to have too many people in this place at any one time. But I would cer certainly hope that we can still welcome people back, not just to the galleries, but to, to the reserve collections as well. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, so then one last question to the whole panel before we take some questions from the audience. In one or two sentences, where do you see the, I mean, we've talked about the absence of crystal balls, but uh, where do you see the, the, the Asian art world being two to five years from now? What are the, what is the one big impact you expect COVID will have had on how the 
cultural and um, arts sector across Asia and the Asian arts sector across the world um, will be impacted by this virus. If we can start perhaps with Victor. I, I, would, I would see artwork will become more valuable than before because uh, when we lost something, we'll find that lost things is more valuable. Now we cannot go in to see the objects, we cannot touch it. Once we have a chance to really see you, now it is it's a now it's a bonus now uh, to see the objects in in person. Then you will find more time to spend on it, and you you will find the value on it, and you more you know appreciate what the original artist put the effort on. So it is kind of something that you lost your physical existence or physical contact with something and you find it more valuable than before. So an increase in financial and cultural value of yes. objects. Yes, you increase that because if everything just click, click, click and you can get it, it is not valuable enough. But uh, when, you, when, you, when you have a little chance, uh, let's have a one, just one chance to go to a VNA for your lifetime, maybe, and then you find it and you, and you spend the whole time focusing on every second that you spend on it. Great. Okay. Um, one sentence from you, Calvin. What's the one thing that will change five years from now? Sorry. Uh, tech and art um, will be uh, something really uh, worth expecting, um, how it evolves. And second is um, the gallery and also art fair industry. I believe there would be some significant changes. I, I cannot predict, I don't know, but I just feel that uh, it's, it's happening. Mm. So transformation is coming and that transformation will be driven by technology. Yes. Okay, great. Jonathan. Um, I have to say, I love Victor's idea and I kind of wish I'd said it, <laughs> but um, not, not, because of, not because of the, the monetary value of the works of art, but I love this idea that if you can't, if you can see the works of art less often in person, they actually become more valuable um, in, in, a, in a cultural or in a meaningful sense, not just in a, um, not just in a um, monetary sense. But of course, wearing my commercial hat, I sincerely hope they do become more valuable in a monetary <laughs> sense as well. So maybe you can get it both ways. Um, I mean, the other thing I, I really think is, I mean, the technology, the, the technological changes that we're going through is, is, is are going to be transformative. Whatever shape they take, um, I think that the transform, transformation of our world because of technology, I'm um, saying this for the third time, has really been accelerated. And this, this will be the, uh, apart from Victor's beautiful idea, I think this will be the thing that we come out of this situation with. Anna. Well, yes, I probably would echo both Jonathan and um, uh, Victor there. I mean, I think the new technology will change possibly the way that we engage with, with our audiences. But we're in a world now where uh, UNESCO reckons that at least 13% of museums around the world are going to have to close as a consequence of this because they will not be able to sustain themselves financially. Um, so I think that you know, the world will hopefully wake up to understand how important museums are and that we, we, you know, the V&A is just custodian of all the wonderful things that we have there. And I hope that people will realize what, what value those collections have, those Asian art collections have, but also what value museums have in the world. Wonderful. Thank you all very much for, for your contributions. And now it's with great pleasure that I can offer some, some questions from our, from our audience. Um, I'll put a few quite specific ones to you first. So Anna, a question to you from a number of our, our audience members. Is Kimono going to reopen? And if so, in what guise? OK, well, yes. Um, as you can imagine, I was very depressed when I thought it might not. But yes, we are hoping to relaunch the exhibition. Um, again, I'm, I can't quite say what the dates, but I would hope that the, the, the exhibition will be running for three, through September and October. Like every museum in the world, we are negotiating with our lenders now to make sure they're happy with their objects staying with us for another few months because they should be, you know, the exhibition should have been closing at the end of this month. Um, but it will open, you know, it's all sitting there now. So we just have to, you know, take the tissue off and turn the lights back on. Um, but obviously, I think we will obviously be 
you know, the number of people we can actually allow through the door will, will we actually be able to come to be able to travel to the VNA to see it um, will be reduced. But yes, it will, should, should be there in, in all its glory, hopefully by the beginning of September. Thank you very much. Um, another question posed really to the whole panel by a number of people. We've talked a lot about digital platforms for the communication of physical art. What about art that exists solely in the digital realm, digital art? Is that something that we will see a rise of in the COVID era? Perhaps um, we can have a response from Victor um, and, then, um, and then from Jonathan to start this off. Well, I think um, <clears throat> digital artwork exists uh, uh, early in the 80s. So uh, uh, it doesn't really matter on uh, digital artwork because it's always online and it's uh, created. Um, but um, uh, the new challenge coming out, it more on just on the screen. It will be more in immersive, like in the environment, or you can wear a VR and then you go into the digital world. So that is something that happening now. Um, I think uh, it, it, will, it will get, it will, we will have technologies and also platform and also audience for more and more digital artwork uh, to be created in, in the near future, I will see. Okay, and for uh, Jonathan, if you can speak briefly to the commercial world's relationship to digital art, and then Anna, the institutional world. Mm. Um, I think, yes, I mean, I think, I think it must be a given that there will be a greater emphasis or greater uh, response to digital art. I mean, one of the, one of the things that we did talk about in Victor and Carver for part of this was the whole role of AI in <laughs> yes. art. Um, and I have to be very honest to say that I'm the last person on the planet to be competent, I think, to speak about this. But I think that this is a, I think this is a really interesting topic and where AI and art go together, I think is something that might be used for another topic, a forum, Marco. Thank you. Um, Anna? <laughs> yes, and um, the VNA is very actively engaged now in collecting digital art. We have a department where their remit is to collect it. But in fact, one of the first big pieces of digital art the VNA collected was actually Korean. Um, a Yi Yoon Chang who did a piece, Kang, sorry, Yi Yoon Kang who did a piece called Casting, which was actually a projection in our cast courts. Um, which was a, it was an amazing ex experience and it was interesting because the cast courts themselves are a form of reproduction in the way that digital is now a form of reproduction. Um, so that was, uh, and, that, and we acquired that piece and this, there's certainly quite a lot of work being done about, you know, what kind of digital art we can acquire and how do you, how do you store it for the future, which is another challenge, of course. Thank you. Um, a question from one of our SOAS postgrad diploma alumni, and the Curator Emeritus of the Renaissance Art Collections at uh, the Philadelphia Museum in uh, North America, Carl Straker. He asks, in the UK and USA, COVID-19 has had a greater impact on minority communities. Will this dynamic perhaps engender a rethink of how museums present works of art and how universities teach them? Perhaps, Anna, if you would like to respond to that from the, um, uh, the V&A's perspective, and I'll say what I can from SOAS. Well, certainly, I think the diversity of our collections is is something that's it, that's very important to the VNA and sort of representing diverse uh, cultures and diverse um, creativity. And I think this will it certainly leads us to think about how we can really in, encourage that um, both in our in our collecting, in our displays, in our programs. It's something obviously we've been doing up until this point, but I think this is. Um, heightened awareness of what, of what we're doing and the importance of what we're doing um, and certainly in terms of divert, trying to sort of diversify our audiences particularly who visits the museum and even who works in the museum so I think it's a very important point. So to speak from uh, to respond to Carl's question from the point of view of the SOAS postgrad diploma and as well as a, a position in the history of art and archaeology department at SOAS we have a, an active agenda to decolonize our curriculum where we are looking to change the, the Eurocentric narrative that has driven much of our history as a discipline um, and indeed across the other uh, departments and other academic methodologies that, in, that we teach at SOAS. So we are, we are actively working on this, but as Anna says, the, the current global experience perhaps foregrounds the immediacy. It accelerates the need for this kind of action to take place and to take place effectively. So it's something we're working on and we are, we are working to develop ever faster as it becomes ever more urgent in our changing global environment. 
Um, we perhaps have time for one more question as we're about to run over. Um, and this has come from a, a number of people, um, but a, a general uh, question about the, the broader political context in which COVID-19 is occurring, particularly and its impact on the, the Asian art market, whether it's the, uh, the US trade war with China or the recent change in legislation from Beijing that affects the security situation in Hong Kong. I wonder um, if Jonathan and Calvin perhaps could speak to that, uh, the impact of the, the broader geopolitical context in which COVID has happened and how these aggregate factors might reshape the, um, the, the art market globally. Um, and one questioner asked specifically how it might reshape the position of London within that, that global market. So Jonathan, perhaps we can hear from you first. Um, gosh, wow. Okay. <laughs> um, I've not, I, I don't feel quite competent at the moment to speak about London. Um, I might defer to those of you who are in London or um, have galleries in London to, to answer that one. Um, I think in the general, in the general context, um, I think the, the trade war, the, one of the issues that we've been dealing with was the imposition of a tariff on Chinese works of art going, in, going into the United States. Um, and there are, this has been somewhat, somewhat mitigated in that the tariff has been reduced and there are now mechanisms in place with, without going into the complications of it, whereby you can, you, you have a sort of temporary import scheme. I'm sorry, this is a bit technical, but there is a scheme whereby you, you, you can temporarily import somebody and then you don't, you can get the tariff rebated if you, if it's taken out of the country again, but nonetheless, um, for, you know, our colleagues in New York who source property from around the world, Chinese property for the sales there, this has been, this has been an issue because there has been this tariff imposed by the Trump administration on Chinese works of art of any kind, uh, go, including antiques going into the US. And that's been a bit of a, made life a little bit more complicated. Um, as for Hong Kong, um, I'm not sure that the change in the security legislation is going to have an immediate effect mm -hmm. or will, I don't believe it will necessarily have an effect on the art market in Hong Kong because I think so long as Hong Kong remains uh, as good a place as it is now to do business um, then I think I think there is there is a bright future in Hong Kong and I think just the security law by itself uh, is, in my own opinion, unlikely to have an effect on that. Um, but yeah, thank you, John. I'm trying not to say I'm not trying not to say crystal balls again. But yeah. um, I, I, I'm fairly, I'm fairly, I am optimistic about the resilience of the market in Hong Kong. Okay, um, and now one, uh, Kelvin, do you have anything to, to add to that from the point of view of the expos you run in, in Taipei and in Shanghai, looking outside of the Hong Kong environment? Uh, I share the view of Jonathan, so I'm still very confident of the Hong Kong market. Um, I also see um, perhaps growing importance of London market as well. Um, because of the situation like the, 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 the US and all this trade war and and in Asia um, we are still a, a, a growing market. Um, the, the the Chinese market is actually booming. Um, I, I, that's why I, I think uh, the buying power is st still in Asia, um, the more dynamic. Um, so um, I still believe that Hong Kong and London are uh, a vibrant market um, for yeah. For, for Asian arts. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Good confidence and, and resolution. Um, so perhaps I, I said that was to be our last question, but I'd like to give one, one more question before we move on, uh, before we thank uh, and close the panel. Um, this is one that was pre-submitted to us that I'm only just getting the chance to get to. And it comes from Christie's Regional Managing Director for Asian and World Art and Chairwoman for Asian Art in London, Leila DeVos. She asks, um, looking back uh, a few months ago, when Art Basel Hong Kong was canceled, due to the outbreak of the pandemic. Hong Kong seemed to have led the online and virtual platforms for exhibitions. Sales and events very, quick, very quickly followed. What was the general response and level of engagement of this initiative? 
which initiatives worked the best and were the most effective. So really, this is a question about a virtual environment that is that was created for the sale room. And perhaps we can close with thinking about these virtual spaces we're moving into. Um, maybe, Victor, if you have some first-hand experience of this, I'd like you to respond to this question and tell us what you felt was most effective about the VR environment in Art Basel. Um, and maybe more generally, what can we do to change and improve our virtual reality environments as we move forward into an era reshaped by COVID-19? Well, I think um, um, is the, uh, the speed of uh, the internet. Uh, now we're talking about 5G. Uh, if 5G really happens and it will change uh, how you experience the virtual world, and that means that you will have a better representation of the real one. So that is something that looking forward to uh, as an artist, not as a politician or, or whatever. As an artist, I say um, if we can represent the real work, uh, in a virtual world uh, correctly and professionally because of the um, speed of the internet that that will help a lot um, to recreate the reality. We're going to the matrix. <laughs> okay, so wow, so we're we're moving into a, a new place, a new period, a new time and a new way of engaging with art. Um, I think perhaps we can close on on that note to say that we are moving into a technologically driven world while well, we need to bear in mind the importance of retaining an object of phys uh, a relationship to physical objects. Um, one of the great observations as we all dwelled on here was the hope and the, the belief that even if we become more distant from one another and from the art objects in public collections and private collections, that will hopefully increase the value, both cultural and financial, that underpins our engagement with art. And I would like to, to kind of close on that note, as well as the optimistic hope that the technology for engaging digitally will improve. So it's with that sentiment in mind that I want to thank each of you once again for taking your time to prepare and participate in this panel. Um, and I'll now hand over to my colleague, Dr. Heather Elgood, who will give some closing remarks and, and thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. I wanted to say that from the very beginning when I started this program, that is the Sarah's Postgraduate Diploma in Asian Art, my principle has been to make sure not only the object, but the, the people who spoke to the students were the leading experts. And wherever we could, we would invite them from wherever they are. And one of the great responses to this COVID-19 from my perspective is that today for the very first time we have such a panel which not only reaches the expertise of all of you but also the numbers out there all in different parts of the world so this is very exciting for me and at such a moment that i hand over to malcolm which i have to say for me not the greatest technology person i am not but it is a great moment for me to hand over to Malcolm. So first of all, I want to thank him for this inspired idea. I want to thank Victor and Jonathan and Anna and Calvin for all that they brought to the panel today. And for all of the students who are listening, I want to say hello to you and thank you for your time and attention. And I want to bring to you just to know that next Tuesday, same time, 16th of June, we are running a six uh, program series um, entitled The Reclusion and Cultivation in Chinese Art. And we also want you to know that although we are charging for this, and you can see on the screen the fee, we do have the possibility of free places for those who are shielding due to a medical condition and if you send uh, Denise an email or you write to asianart um, at soas.ac.uk you can actually uh, explain your situation medically or that you have an NHS um, whatever it is that they give you uh, if you have that situation and we are delighted to give you a free place. So we hope very much some of you will join us in our continuation of this very relevant issue that again Malcolm has inspired us to do. So thank you all again very much. And lastly, Patrick, somewhere you are, and Denise, and thank you so much for making this viable and doable. Thank you.